thank you all of you for coming, but especially thank you, Jocelyn, for coming. And uh, Jocelyn has been a friend to the gallery since its inception, and she and Robin have worked tirelessly to help us to, I think they're partly responsible for us getting the wonderful exhibition we've got here. And um, it's been an amazing exhibition, the Australian Watercolour Institute exhibition. I'm sure you'll all agree, it's just stunning. And hopefully the year after next we'll have it all over again. But just sit back and enjoy, because I'm sure you're gonna be amazed by Joseph's techniques and thorough enjoyment of her craft. I think that's how I put it more oh, than anything you. else. Thank uh, I'm going to start off by talking to you about just setting up a still life group. Many of you in this audience are probably artists or would be, could be artists or people who have painted once or who had a grandmother that painted or something like that. So you've got some sort of practical interest in this. So first thing is what happens when you set up a still life group. Now I just chucked that there. Uh, it obviously needs a bit more arrangement. And you can do a lot of your composition, a lot of your sorting out of design at this particular area. Now, you can't do that in a landscape. You can't go out and say, it's a really lovely gum tree, but I'd much rather it was near that rock. Um, where's a shovel and spade? You know, you can't do that. But in a still life, you can move things around on your workbench before you start painting. So let's have a little look at that. Now, um, I just prop that up there and hopefully it'll stay there. Um, now, will I have some of that back there? I, mean, I might try and do that, so I'll move that blue over it. Now, there's far too many repetitive folds there. Let's simplify that. Let's have a little look at this um, white drop. Now, how, this, sometimes just by dropping a thing, sometimes that often works very nicely, and sometimes you can just get a, a nice little uh, casual arrangement. But as I'm going to be painting it from over there, I'm going to turn around here and have a little look at what we've got here. That is a lazy line. That line is too much the same as that line. I'm going to put a kick in that and try something a little different there. Okay. And that's looking more possible. Uh, let's now try to put some fruit into that. Uh, how will we go? Will we have uh, some of these white on white or white on um, maybe? Um, that's a couple of slightly yellower ones over there. Uh, just pull that bit of skin off and get that nice little spontaneous bit of yellow. Let's try something a bit smaller so that we have a change of scale. And let's just arrange it so that it breaks over that white line. Now that's not going to be very good. I've got two and two. What could I do to make that more interesting? I've got a long shape. A, a red one. Let's try a red one. Let's tuck it in at the back so it's really a colour note rather than a, a shape note. So it'll just really zing. Yeah, that's looking better. Okay, that's good. Now, what about if we put something way over there? Because I'm going to paint on a long board. So I'm going to need something long to do that. Um, how about if I actually buried it in behind some drapery? Yeah, that's a possibility. Let's change that. That's too sharp a line. Let's just move that a bit so we do half there. Yeah, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Can, can okay. I just interrupt one moment? Yes. Why, you have to ask, ask yourself the question, why is she taking the trouble to move and remove and readjust all that stuff on the table there? Why? Why? Come, go back behind it. This is your, this is your challenge. Why is she doing this? To make it more interesting, to make the painting that she makes more interesting, so you will want to know this person. So she's exercising her interest-making factor, so you'll be interested in the person who painted it. So she's really aggrandizing herself through the reorganisation of the world, and that is what artists do. Sorry, Joe. That's fine. Please chip in, uh, Rob. You can do a bit of aggrandizing hand in there to anyone who hasn't got. Okay, now normally I would, having painted so often and so many times, quite often I will work directly onto the watercolour board. That is how I stretch my watercolour paper. I literally have these framed boards, plywood with a little bit of strengthening of lightweight cedar, uh, well glued down with some PVA, and then I cut the watercolour paper, that's a sheet cut 
longitudinally, you can cut them that way or square or whatever, but it's up to you. So I have the board in proportion, so I don't waste too much. Uh, I cut the paper, put it under the shower, attach it lightly to the shower screen while it's, uh, give it a second wetting, put it down on a piece of uh, tabletop, something clean, piece of laminex or something, put the frame down on top, fold and mitre the corners and stick some drawing pins, or in that case they're old style drafts and pins which you probably wouldn't get now, I've got a lot. And uh, you, um, you don't do any, stretching doesn't mean pulling and tugging, it just means wetting the paper, it stretches and expands itself. And then you put that out in the sun to dry and uh, it will go drum top. So that's a stretch piece of board. Okay, then you make sure you keep it in a plastic bag, big enough to hold it. Don't have it hanging around your studio, particularly if you're near the salt sea, uh, without some sort of protection because it will ease into the size of the paper and the next time you use it, you will not get good washes. Now, what I'm going to do here is just put a piece of drawing paper and I'm just going to fold it or trim it down so that it's the size of that and just show you the sort of things that you can do as far as composition goes so that we have something there to work on. Well, that's the other one. And so that we can just say, well, this will give me a little bit of an idea of the sort of compositional problems. Now, normally I would not put charcoal or Conte onto a watercolour paper surface, only pencil, and probably only an HB or 2B pencil, and only a putty rubber for rubbing out, one of those kneadable rubbers. But at this stage, I'll just show you the sort of things. And this way, we can always rearrange our composition. So we look here and say, okay, I'll have that there, yes. Uh, quite often I'll use Conte to start with, and I'll find something like that. No, that's going to be very awkward. So in the drawing, e even at this stage, I can say, hang on, I'll just go over there and fix that. That is not going to be a pleasant angle. Now, that might be a lot better. Okay, so little things like that you can do. Uh, oh, yeah, much better. Okay, at this stage. There'll be an onion there, there'll be that one in there. Uh, just, and it'll be a sort of tonal composition. Uh, that's the um, garlic onion there, and uh, then that's going to climb up, and there'll be that little onion tucked away in there. So that'll be the focus area, about two thirds along the, the job. Uh, so that will be probably that onion there, there'll be the little yellow one there, that will be there, that'll be all, oops, that. that'll be all very dark there, that'll be the red one tucked into there. Yeah, I think that will work quite well. So that'll be a nice little composition through there. So uh, you could rearrange that. If we had time, I could pull all that to pieces and try another design, which quite often one enjoys doing. I mean, if you like doing compositions, you, you sort of quite like pulling it to pieces and trying another composition. So, you know, it gives you a bit of an idea there of focal point, secondary point of interest, how am I going to make those flow lines work? Are there going to be some right angle thrusts through there? That's through there, something which will keep that together in some way. So that's just a very rough, a very rough rough, but in the time available, you know, we're not going to go into it in any more detail. Now, you can put that handy there to look at, and I'll use that as a rough guide for what I'm doing, but I'm actually going to use a 2B pencil there, and uh, I quite like these clutch pencils. And what you saw me there use was a kneadable rubber, K-N-E-A-D-A-B-L-E, -E, and they're by far the safest sort of rubber or eraser to use uh, on a job. Okay. So I'm just looking at my composition there, which is pretty rough. Uh, I'll just re recompose it. I rethink on the job. It's only a guide. It's not meant to tie you down so that you can't rethink. Okay. There's a garlic onion there, that's going to then sweep right up and then that will be that lovely angle of the blue drape coming in there, that will be the high part there, there will be that little brown onions through there, something like that. So at this stage it's just a very light, very very light, you don't want to put too much pencil on, the more you rub out the more you will damage your watercolour paper and the more difficult it will be for the washers to adhere and flow nicely and easily. So there'll be a little more than that, a little more detail than that, 
If I was doing an architectural subject, such as a facade of a building, uh, like the lady along here has done, or Jeff has done there, uh, obviously I would spend more time drawing it up. In fact, if I was doing a job of, of really detailed architect, I had a commission to do like this. I had to draw the whole front of Sydney Technical College in watercolour. And I literally, I couldn't draw the whole thing in one go because it was too big and you couldn't get back from it. So I drew sections, I took them all home, I joined them up together, I used my perspective knowledge, I drew it up on a piece of layout paper, I traced it down onto the actual watercolour surface and I worked from there. So I did the least damage to the paper. So you do have to change your technique according to the difficulty or the particular type of problem that you have. If you were doing a portrait where you were dependent on accuracy of lightness, you may prefer to draw it up first and even trace it down, depending on your technical skill. So I, I can't give you a one-off answer for that one. Okay. When I'm drawing fruit or any object, I like to look at the axis of the object. It helps me to feel its three-dimensional quality. So, and, and I'm often surprised, even though I've only blocked this in very lightly, because I have been working very quickly, I've been responding to the feelings of the job. So that if a mark's going one way, I respond with a mark going the other way. And quite often I find that that's pretty accurate. concentrate on drawing for a few moments and then I'll hold it up again for you. Now I will often move an object in a little bit. I'm contemplating moving that onion there in a little bit. Not sure yet but maybe a little bit more than it is on that group. Which is something you can either move it physically out there or you can move it mentally on your paper. Uh, you can, if you're very clever, you can even change the light source. I am fairly dependent on the light source that I have. I, I'm inclined to enjoy the light source and not want to change it. And by that I mean the direction of the light. We've got light coming in from the window, it's pretty good. Uh, if not, I would set up a spotlight or something for that. But, you know, you can be very clever and say, well, the light's coming from that way, but I want it coming from the opposite direction. And so you, you can be a very clever change. Okay, I think that'll be, you know, pretty right. So that will be sufficient. Now what I do at this stage then, I get that uh, kneadable rubber, wherever it's gone to. Oh, thank you, good. And I'll just lighten that down a bit, just very lightly, because wherever you have pencil, once you put watercolour on top of it, you cannot change it cannot rub the pencil out. So rub out your pencil, it's enough there, and the rest of it you will do with the brush. You'll figure it out when the time comes. We're not just drawing shapes of objects, we're drawing the shapes and the patterns of the background. You'll see that in a moment because one of the first things I'm going to put in is that dark blue. I quite often like to work from the very dark, fairly early in the job, so that that establishes your contrast. Not all artists like to do that. Some people prefer to work up very lightly in rather delicate tones and gradually come to the dark. And that works quite well too. The only trouble is you put lots of washes one on top of the other and the paper gets a bit tired. The more times you have to put washes one on top of the other, the tired of the paper will get. If you look at Judy Kassab's paintings over there later, you'll see they're probably just a one-off wash or maybe two but uh, it's the, the richness of which she puts that paint on that has that lovely sparkle. If you keep messing around with it, you will lose that vitality. Okay. Watercolour is one of the cheapest techniques. The paper itself may cost you a little bit, uh, but really it's a very portable medium. It's something as Turner found that you can travel with. Um, and if you look at Turner's paint box <laughs> in the uh, Tate, it's just incredible to see the, uh, the uh, simple little, rather grubby little paint box he walked around with. You wonder how he ever got the richness that he did. Okay, I'm using an indigo here with a bit of burnt sienna. Um, I might put a little tad of ultramarine into that. 
Uh, so it's an interesting little mixture of warm and cool, and uh, a certain amount of water, but not too, not so much that I'm going to dilute that too much. And I'm going to just go straight into that and enjoy the wonderful richness of that. So you've got to be brave, really. Okay, how brave can you be? Big brush that will hold a lot of paint. of your paper, you can even change, I'm just putting a bit more ultramarine in over here, and you can do that. The delight in the, and the delight of the mark making itself is quite a wonderful thing, and there's a lot of artists that just use that as the basis of their art, just the, the, the mark making itself, the adventure of mark making. So, uh, no, there's nothing wrong with that, doing little quick sketches. You're going to get splashes of paint there, but as long as your mummy doesn't mind, that's all right. <laughs> that's okay. Right, so there we are. Now, something I was going to, wasn't going to, but I'm going to put that, <coughs> I actually left it out, almost on purpose. And um, I'm just wondering whether I might just leave it out anyway. Let's try it without it. I've left out an onion, and that was a something that one often does on the on the run. Let's try it without it. <coughs> the composition will be fine. Okay, after that, so I believe that. So you can still change things as you go along. Now, with watercolour, you can tip it and move your board around a little bit just to get that paint spreading a little bit. Uh, you could also use a fan brush. Sometimes I have one, yeah, there's one there. Sometimes a fan brush. Uh, a very much manipulated fan brush, one that I've actually dog-eared and moved around. Sometimes you can just spread a little bit if you want the paint to spread a little bit. Okay, that'll be all right. But it's just a means of getting the paint to move and spread it. Now, you can't work near that dark wash at this stage. Um, I can see a little problem happening there. I think we might end up with a more watermark there. Now, what I'm going to do there to avoid that is the watermark is caused by uneven drying. I'm just going to actually add a little more dark and wet paint into that, just while it's wet. And I think that'll I'll get away with that. Yep, that'll be right. So knowing your surface, knowing when you can come back into something and put on some paint that's the same degree of wetness. There are different degrees of wetness. Knowing what you can do is important. What I think I'll do now is this foreground. So I'm going to mix up a nice neutral sort of slightly warm neutral. Probably use an Indian red. Uh, so it's a stage where you probably need to change your water. So I might uh, get someone to do that. So, um, okay, let's just have a look there. It's a much lighter tone. I try to get the things set up so that I have things where I want them to be. I, I, I quite enjoy the idea of running by the skin of your teeth, as it were. Uh, I quite enjoy that feeling of adventure and not knowing quite where it's going. So sometimes that gives a vitality to the work. Get a bit more raw sienna and then light red into that. That's actually a bit of Indian there, which is a slightly cool there. Okay. always make that a little darker. As I said, you can always put another wash on. It's just whether you want to do that is another matter. Excuse me, Justin. Yes. What does a watermark look like? Um, it's like a watermark. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, yeah, it's when you often get a, a, a run or something where water has run back. Um, you know, a, a surface that is starting to dry and you've suddenly added more water to it. And you can see, I could have that problem here because that has started to dry because I work from the left side. Now, by my putting that brush there, I, I know what I'm doing, but if I put that too wet, it can run back and end up with a 
a real huddle there. So even at that stage, it's looking an interesting pattern. And that's the thing that you've got to look at, because it's that that is going to carry on the wall. It's got to look like a good poster. I had a teacher at art school, Jimmy Cook, who said, the first thing that a painting has to look like is a good piece of commercial art. In those days, commercial art was not what it is today, and things were good posters, you know, exciting patterns and shapes that carried very well. Toulouse-Lautrec was a wonderful example of a, an artist who was a great poster artist, and so have many other artists have been so. So uh, that's, you know, a good start there. Well, what happens is we can't work on edges that are near to areas that are wet. And so that is one of the reasons we use the hairdryer to dry off those areas. They are, because it's a fairly warm day, they're starting to dry, uh, but there are going to be some wet, wet spots there. Um, in the meantime, just a little bit of information here. There's two of my books floating around, which, uh, and a sketchbook. You're welcome to have a look at those. And the books are available in the shop. And hopefully you also have got those little invites that Rob's been handing around come along and see lots and lots of figures. I love drawing figures. Uh, the rhythm and movement of the human figure is marvellous. Still life is great because it doesn't run away. Figures you've got to draw very quickly, as you will see with my uh, little sketchbook there, how quickly you have to be able to interpret the figure. go for the colours in the fruit first of all. The reason too that I've chosen onions and things like that to paint is because you can be fairly creative with the shapes. You're not tied down too much with them. Whereas if I had set out to draw a um, pot or a bottle or something like that, the amount of time would have exceeded the time available this afternoon. So. Here I am just working very freely into this wall tank, that'll be great. Thank you very much. I almost draw with the point of the brush. These brushes are marvellous to work with. That's a little bit of gold ochre, lovely colour, and it's a marvellous colour. See how I often drop a bit of colour into it while it's wet? And, and just leave it, you know, the freshness of that is part of it. I've let it actually run down and join into a shadow there, which I can fix up later. Now it's no good me trying to do the dark red onion because that's too wet there, but there's another nice light coloured onion over here, so let's have a little look at that one. And it's quite dark against this back. We're going to have to put some more tone on the drape, don't worry, it's not going to stay white, but I've got to start somewhere. And my attitude to watercolour is to put as little overwashes as you can so that you keep it fresh. If you want to fiddle around with the watercolour, you're better off to use the egg tempera technique, which I've used on that painting over there, where uh, you can actually scratch back and move it around a little bit. So uh, you can also wipe out with a rag, you can also use a sponge. Now here's a sponge, which I've wet previously, and you can do something like that. So you can actually have the light on the top of the fork. Now there's a case where the water has run down into a bit of a blob, I know where it is, it's all right, but I'm just going to dry that brush and lift that off. Now, I think that could take a little more dark warm over there, so I'm using a bit of light red there, and I'm just going to drop a little bit into that. And sometimes just a light scribble on the tip of your brush, just lightly brush it in while it's damp. But you've really got to be an expert at knowing the wetness of your paper. Because if you don't know that and you put on something too wet, you will have trouble. You're safer off to be a bit dry. That is why it's good to start wet on any area that you're going to work on because you can always go drier. If you start too dry, that's what beginners do. They wipe off all the paint off their brush and then they end up with a very dry surface. Then they try to wet it and then you get watermarks. So that's a little, little tip there, okay? Um, all right, we're coming along there. Now I'm going to very soon, I'm going to use the hair dryer or noise for a minute. Get those two dry, then I can work on the folds. And while I'm working, while I'm working on the folds, I'll work on the garlic onion. So he's only another fold.
sometimes these little light flecks get left there, and sometimes they work as light, sometimes they don't. Um, yep, sorry. So we've still got the pattern there, we've still got the strong contrast, but I'm now going to put some washes on the drape, and I'm going to use a mixture of mauve and raw sienna. Why am I using mauve and raw sienna? Come on, where's the students have painted? Oh, because they're in paint box, that's a good idea, yeah. What else? <laughs> Complementary colours, okay? Yellow and purple, top of the, of the colour wheel is yellow, down the bottom is purple on most colour wheels that I've learned on, and they're opposite colours. Yellow ochre is a soft, reduced yellow. By mixing it with mauve and water, you will get some lovely greys. Now, depending whether you want a little slightly more yellow grey or a slightly cooler grey is your variation of, of those two. And it's an excellent colour to use. Now, what I'm actually going to do there, I'm going to actually wet the whole of that drapery with a brush. Um, okay, just going to I'll get some more water in that one. We really need a, tubs and tubs of water. Yeah. We need a bucket of water. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do there is I'm actually going to, uh, I think I'll wait for some clean water because that's got, take that out and get that too, please, sorry. You really need a lot, a lot of water. A bucket of water in your studio when you're working with watercolour is essential. So you need to be able to change that water continually. So if you're going out of door painting, you need to put in your backpack, you know, a bottle of water or paint near a nearby creek or creek, uh, stream or something so that you can top it up. Uh, just watch what stream you're getting it out of, especially if you're going to drink it at the same time. <laughs> What's the brush you're using? I'm using those, uh, uh, it's a Roy Mac, uh, look, you can get those sort of brushes, there are variations of them at most art shops. I think a size about that size is probably going to hit you for about $100, uh, unless you get it at an art sale. But, uh, so, um, yeah. Okay, thank you, but that, that's lovely. Okay, now what I'm going to do there, I'm actually just going to put a very delicate uh, raw sienna wash over the whole of this stripe, right out to the edge. I'm uh, just going to, to, got a little bit of blue in the brush, but that won't matter. Okay, so I'm just going to literally go over this. I know I've got to do that red onion. I'll come back to that. She'll be right. Typical Australian comment, she'll be right. I'm actually going to take that right down over the foreground. So, and that's what you can do with watercolour. You can say, well, okay, I think I'll just take that right down while I've got there and take that right out to there. It's picking up a bit of the blue here and there. That's all right, no problem. Now, if I can work quickly enough, and this is where it's so important to work quickly, I can put in all the modelling I need and everything on that one painting while I'm doing it. Okay, let's uh, and that's a fair bit of yellow on that fellow there too. Yeah, that'll be right. Okay, I'll leave a little bit of white on the side because no, I won't. I'll just drop in a little bit of that slightly brighter yellow there. Okay, right, I'll do that while I'm there. So thinking as much as I can across the whole job. The side of the garlic onion is a fairly yellow. Yeah, right up to there. And uh, I'll actually come along with a bit of uh, madder brown, which is a nice colour, and I'll just warm that top corner a little bit, and I'll let that flow right down to that. And I don't mind even if it goes over the onion a little bit, that'll be all right. And I'll come right down to there, and that will give a unity to the whole picture. Now you could say, well, why didn't she do that when she started? Well, yeah, I suppose I could have done that too. Um, you know, it's point in which you feel comfortable in doing what you're doing. Yeah. Right, now while that's there, I'm just going to drop in a little bit of this mode we were talking about. And I'm just going to drop that mode into those areas and use that too strong, too strong, just a bit more raw sienna in with the mode, that'll be better, and uh, maybe a little bit of um, indigo, just a tiny little bit of indigo, that'll just cool that down a bit. So, you see, I'm actually mixing on the painter. Um, being confident to do that too. Okay, that's better. Yeah. Confident. But you won't get confident by being nervous. <laughs> if you're learning to drive a car, I mean, you've got to put in the gear and get going, otherwise, you know, it won't work. 
So there we are. Now you can also use a sponge while you're there and you could wipe out a little bit of that light fold. You could do that. You can actually draw a bit like you have a, a putty rubber there. Yeah, yeah. So the sponge is a, a very useful drawing tool. Okay, I'll come back into here. I want a little bit more of that. Mauve, mauve and indigo, I think that'll just take the buy down. The mauve was a little bit strong by itself. The fun part is when we start to do some adjustments in a moment. That'll be when we'll start to see where the, the finesse of the composition comes in. The moment it's wet, wet and dribbly, it's all over you. I'm well known for getting most of the paint around my ears, but that's all right. I went to get dressed Mark, when I left here this morning and I said to my partner, why have I got glitter and crimson in my hair? And he said, oh, you do it, throw yourself into it. Right, okay. Now, I'm going to have to put that flat because otherwise it's all going to run down to the bottom. <laughs> and I'm going to use the sponge and just wipe out a few more of these light bits as drawing light. Rinse and clean the sponge. The water will last a lot better in the later parts of the painting because it's in the beginning where you're working fairly broadly. Don't forget that no painting is a copy. It's all interpretation. That is your reference. That's your research place. And it's up to you to work with that and change it around. Okay, now I'm going to dry that before it runs away from me. Okay, it won't take too long. Going to just re establish. I'm just hoping that's dry enough. It's a little bit on the damp side. Just some of those little folds there. And I'm just going to draw in them almost like little chiseled pieces of drawing. It's a little bit damp still. It almost needs a little bit more drying. soften a little bit of an edge by just a bit more water and very quickly drying it. Another thing that's very useful, which I didn't bring along, is a bit of blotting paper. You can buy blotting paper from art shops now and it's uh, quite nice to work with. Now I'm actually drawing this as well at the same time. Anybody wanting to take a photograph or anything, I have no problem.
says blurring out a little bit there because it's not quite dry enough. A little bit impatient there. Sometimes those impatient points work, you know, sometimes you can get away with them. It's really quite, the white drape has become quite dark up in there. Sometimes you can just soften the edge of a fold and give it quite a three-dimensional feeling by just uh, almost dry brushing an area like that, just softening that out and you just blend in and you'll get the feeling that it's a, a nice soft drape. Can't hold up too much on the bits of head right on that one. Better run away with me. Just a little bit more in there. Just a hint of it. You can see how wet and dribbly it is. Okay, I'll just dry that off again, then I'll darken the foreground a little bit more, and I'll just get start to a bit more modelling in a couple of those things and knock that onion back there. especially if you're painting in a very hot day. So, um, you know, you can have those other alternative experiences. I'm just going to get that very dark object back there, that dark red onion, a little bit of alizarin crimson, nice. and a little bit of brown matter, and a set of ultramarine blue, I think, and it's really quite strong there, and fairly strong paint. So it works so wet that this is why it's sort of I might just leave the white paper for the highlights and then put that cool light in afterwards. You can also just drop some colours into it while it's wet. I'm going to drop a little bit of red into there. Again, enjoy the shape that that red onion makes up against the surroundings. And it's got a little bit of apple, a little bit of peel there coming off that. I'm just going to try a little bit of actual real crimson in there. So I'm just going to drop that right into it while it's wet. You know, just quite almost pure pink. Don't have to water it down at all. And that'll just zing in there. Okay. Now look, we're almost on the homeward run. What we've got to do now is to get a little more strength in the form into some of the nearby objects, like the front of this onion. It's coming fairly near to us there. So we really need to just put a little more colour and a bit more drawing, more chroma. The chroma is the intensity of the colour. So that needs to just come up a bit there. And I purposefully put that fellow there so that he would have a little more strength there. Uh, just get a little more, even quite a little tad of, of yellow there, a little bit of whimsy yellow there, and just, it might look a little bit strong, but I think it needs it. A bit of artistic license, as you say. A drop of that nice uh, uh, raw sienna there. Raw sienna, one of my favourite colours in both oil paint and watercolour. Um, a little tiny dot of dark for the. Uh, end of the onion there, it, it probably will need a little more attention there later. And then I'll put the dark underneath it, so leave that one there. Um, some details on the garlic onion, just 
And there's some things you give it the shape of those lovely fonds. What are they? They're showing up because there's dark and light on them and that there's form created by the light and dark. So we just have to really draw into that a little bit and show the model. Um, excellent exercise in drawing is to shade some garlic onions or shade some drapery and just see how that will work there. Now sometimes I will leave it fairly strong like that and then I'll come back with a second run there. I just like to leave that strength there and then just soften that a bit later because otherwise I'll uh, lose that there. What's that there? Oh, oh yes, it is dry. <laughs> That's all right. Good idea. Uh, a little bit too wet there. And just lift that back up with your sponge. And you can always scrape back, be draw back. And that's where a piece of blotting paper would be very good. I don't think I brought any. Or a paint rag, and just dry that off and try not to tip it down in that direction. Okay? Or oh, we'll get the hair dry, that's the other top, and dry it off. So I'm just dry that little paper. Opportunity there. Better. And a little bit more over here, I think, on this fellow. I'm not going to darken the background up the corner there. I'll see, I might not. See if it works. If it works, I'll leave it. If it doesn't work, I'll darken it. You don't have to darken it or change it just because it's out there. It's what works in your painting that counts. Painting doesn't have to be a mirror of your reference. Reference is very useful, but it's not not a god. Okay. Giving a bit more strength there. That could create a watermark there. Uh, I'll just get a bit more dark up here behind this. And that loses itself a little bit more there. Now that I've dried that, I can take that down and tuck that in there. In the studio, when I paint things like eggshells and that, I would paint a lot more slowly. I've obviously put this together for a demo, uh, a bit of reflection off the onion coming back into that. And so I have worked fairly quickly over this, but I think it's giving you the essentials of what it's about. Just knock that piece back there. A term I often use in painting is, I'm going to knock that back. And people must think I'm getting a hammer and nail out and I'm going to, you know, have a dab at it in some way like that. Whereas uh, it's just a term that artists use when you want to reduce something, uh, take it back from the attention from the front by some means. Maybe putting a wash over it or alternatively bringing something forward that's in the front and you want that to be stronger. So that's so just here where I'm trying to really get a little bit of strength where that onion comes underneath there. Now that's going to need a hair dryer there because I want to put a little dark shadow under that onion. painting that's over there on the wall would have been developed a lot more slowly than this 
and more carefully in its preparation and planning. Uh, I didn't set out to draw eggshells, or we've been still part on the first one now. So, you know, I'm just pointing that out to you. This is a quick demo to give you an insight into the basic compositional problems, things like strengthening up this near foreground, as I'm now doing, just to, to uh, emphasise this, to tuck that a little bit of strength under there where that onion comes in there. Uh, Bring that down into that, that will help to just zip that up a little bit there. These are the sort of compositional things that you need and that can be either done patiently or quickly, whatever. Um, under this little garlic onion, there's some nice little darks that actually give you the drawing of the garlic onion. And so they'll come in here, there's a nice little cast shadow which also helps to do that. I'll hold this up in a moment and you can just see how these little touches of dark, what they do for the job. Mm -hmm. Right down to this corner is quite interesting. In fact, what you could do there, what might actually do that, is to add the second line across it. Uh, piece of board that the whole thing's sitting on, that'll help us to have another horizontal across the job, which I think will actually help the composition. So I'll just bring that along. I'll oh, take a rider's trick here, putting your brush along the edge of the board for a straight line. Yeah. I'll sign rider's trick. And uh, just strengthen that up underneath that a little bit there. Join that in with that, and that'll really help to establish a, a strength there. So thinking on your feet a little bit, willing to adapt as it goes along. So, oh, that, you know, that walks into the picture and I rather like that possibility. Now, we need a little bit more dark over there under that. It's just about, taken about as far as one can for a quick painting like this. I said we'd do it in an hour. Not that I was trying to beat the gun, but um, it just means that uh, that's about as much as one can do because in working very freely, you put down the top of that, now there's a couple of things, we can either make that a bit bigger, or we can just put a cool wash right up here into the back of that and just link that right through there, which I think might actually help there. And that little angle might just oppose that angle through there. I think that could be quite, I quite like, little things like that happen. See that line, it's a little break in it. Now that's what Margot Hinder used to call it for freeze. Little things that happen and you think, oh, uh, you don't ignore them. And that's where the amateur sometimes says, oh, I must lengthen up that line. And you say, why? You know, so let, let nature do nice things for you. And if you get it for free, you say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes it's not as accidental as you think because you, as an artist, your intuitive nature is probably making decisions that are not conscious in your head, that are just happening anyway. And, you know, that's the sensitivity that should be there as an artist, that you should be able to respond to those things, you know, easily and simply behind that. So it's gradually getting a strength to it. You know, you could keep doing this, there's a little bit here. Not, you can't do a lot, but you can do a little. There's a lovely little cast shadow behind that onion there, behind that piece, which brings up the drawing. There's a little dark in there that's just going to just emphasise the drawing under there. A little accent there, uh, a little accent there, you know. And these little things will just help to, to establish it. Now, sometimes you'll get overruns like that, and that's a good time to just watch that. You can fix it later with a bit of blotting paper. Brian Stratton is an expert at that. He works over the thing with his blotting paper and his brush, fiddling around getting those rocks right, and getting those soft edges and sharp edges that he's so magnificent. You know, that just automatically happened there. You need plenty of paint rag. The best paint rags are singlets.